Hey everyone, thanks for coming. Thanks for uh, joining us today. I'm Brendan from the transportation team. My very big privilege and honor to introduce Donna Kotick today. Uh, she's here from uh, LA. You know her as the uh, TV and film actress. Uh, one of her big hits, of course, is the TV show Castle. Um, beyond that, though, she's a strong advocate for the environment and for transportation. Uh, having lived throughout the world, she's uh, often observed uh, transportation issues in many different places. Um, she's uh, very passionate about not accepting this car-centric fate, and so she's dedicated her time to a new organization called the Alternative Travel Project. Just a few years old now, uh, she's going to share a little bit more about her experiences. So join me in welcoming her. Henry Ford set out to make an automobile anyone could afford. The Model T became so affordable that a worker could buy it in only four months' pay. By the 1920s, the market had reached saturation. Those who desired a car already owned one, as 90% of all trips were made by rail car. Around the 1950s, things started to change. The streetcar conspiracy by the author and former U.S. Senate antitrust attorney Bradford Snell refers to the allegations that GM and other companies like Firestone through subsidiaries, purchased and dismantled trams, trolleys, and electric trains in many cities across the United States in order to eliminate the car industry's number one competitor. Others argue that the fall of public transportation was due to the culmination of other factors such as the depression, labor unrest, market forces, urban sprawl, and other causes favoring private vehicle ownership. One author was quoted as saying, Clearly, GM waged a war on electric traction. It was indeed an all-out assault, but by no means the single reason for the failure of rapid transit. Also, it is just as clear that the actions and inactions by government contributed significantly to the elimination of electric traction. Americans had a wake-up call with the oil crisis in 1973, and since then, alternative forms of travel have been on the rise. Most notably again in the 2000s with the U.S. involvement in the Middle East and people's realizations that we as a country cannot be dependent on fossil fuels. Then again for others, it was simply just an idea one morning. You know, one summer day, I just said, you know what, it's time for me to just find a new way to get to work. I was just so tired of being in a car. And, uh, and literally within a week, I had my bicycle. Hi, uh, my name is Stana Kadic. I am here to talk with you today about ATP. Many of you know uh, ATP to be adenosine triphosphate, <laughs> the energy carrying shuttle service molecule found in the cells of all living things. Not a very big deal, but to me, it's the acronym for one of my favorite nonprofits. The Alternative Travel Project. Oddly enough, it also happens to be a nonprofit that I founded. So, what is ATP? Well, it's a global initiative that encourages people to go car free for just one day. We ask people to volunteer days outside of the bubble of their cars by finding new ways to travel. And by new ways, I mean the ancient art of pedestrian travel, cycling, public transit and new tech. <laughs> that being said, I promise you this presentation isn't going to end with me asking you to throw away your Teslas. Cars are great. They're a part of our modern day. They just don't need to be a part of our every day. So why bother? Why does transit, or what does transit have to do with your average Joe other than being a royal nuisance at 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. five days a week? 
I have a huge list of stats and stories that say traveling alternatively has reverberating effects on so many parts of our lives, our health, our environment, and here's the one that really motivates people, our pocketbooks. Um, but we have to start somewhere, so why don't we just start by looking at our future? Let's see where we're going globally. At, uh, at the current pace of urbanization, the world's cities will add 65 million inhabitants every year, every single year for the next 10 years. So if we break that down, and let's say we just look at India, we look at the cities of India, they're going to have to add as much floor space as exists in all of Chicago. China is going to have to add twice that every year. This means that traffic is not going to get better. It's going to get more complicated. I live in Los Angeles. Traffic already sucks. People joke in LA about how dating someone on the other side of town can be a deal breaker, because who wants to do long distance? <laughs> can you guys imagine what a population surge in that city is going to look like? I just got married. <laughs> I'm good. The love of my life lives in my zip code. But I'm worried about my single sisters out there. There is a study that came out this past February, March. Um, scientists at California's Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, the Cancer Prevention Institute of California, UC Davis, and other prestigious science centers linked chronic exposure to ultrafine particles in vehicle exhaust to deaths from heart disease. So ultrafine particles, according to the study, are a key contributor to health problems amongst people living near traffic. The study ran from 2001 to 2007. It took a look at 100,000 middle-aged women across California. These women were teachers and administrators, so people that we need and that we want to stick around. So let's think about it again. What happens when we have a population surge in our cities? Traffic isn't just a health hazard. There's a financial cost to getting people around a city inefficiently. According to recent research, congestion's cost, partly from wasting time and the patience of commuters, equals anywhere from 1.5 to 4% of gross domestic product. So getting people from one part of a city to another efficiently and stress-free has monetary value. So as our city's populations grow, what's the plan? Where are we going? Leaving the roadways as they are has an economic cost, but data also suggests that building more roadways isn't the answer as well, because that has human health costs. This is where we come in. <laughs> the city of Los Angeles is one of the media capitals of the world, as is the city of Google. <laughs> We export lifestyle through our stories, through film, television, internet content, et cetera. And at ATP, we believe that places like Google and Los Angeles or Hollywood, um, we believe we're unique on the global stage because we have an unparalleled potential to affect the vision of what an ideal lifestyle would and could be. Our media, our film and television tales, reach even the most remote international villages and yurts. What kind of tales and lifestyles are we going to be able to export when the majority of storytellers are bound to driving as a main mode of transit? Transit is a secondary thought when it comes to much of entertainment media content. But driving storytellers lead to driving scenes in movies. I know, I have to do them all the time. <laughs> our lives affect our inspiration and imagination. And that has reverberating effects. That has global effects. The messages that we plant in global consciousness now will dictate where we all go. With the extraordinary amount of creative talent and financial power that circulates through this part of the US, we can be at the forefront of technological breakthroughs and municipal services in an unprecedented way. And if we took a quick moment to improve something as simple as the way we get around, the benefits to health, the benefits to business and the environment would be astronomical. So I figure a city that draws some of the most creative people on the planet would be a fertile ground for 
problem solving the next generation's ideas of what metropolitan travel has to look like. There is a way to make it fun, inspiring, and safe. And at ATP, we are trying to be a part of disseminating that vision. Our first year, we asked people across the globe to volunteer days car free. And the response was overwhelming. Stories came in from everywhere, from France, Belgium, South Africa, Argentina, Minnesota. I mean, everywhere. <laughs> I've shared this one often. It's a good story, so bear with me if you've heard it before. Um, there was a school in Romania that, as a result of this initiative, decided to take on the challenge and create car-free Fridays. Um, what happened was that people that were connected to the school started meeting each other on buses, on sidewalks, and so on. And a little over a year and a half later, there were two weddings as a direct result of the Alternative Travel Project initiative. Here's a photo. They now have children. So ATP isn't just about making a love connection. The other benefits of engaging in an ATP lifestyle extend beyond health and economics. There's something called agglomeration. Agglomeration essentially means a heap or cluster of usually disparate elements. There's monetary value to agglomerating people through expanded transit. Planning scholars from UC Berkeley and Rutgers believe the numbers run anywhere from $1.5 million to $1.8 billion dollars, depending on a city's size. And at Google, you guys are doing a fantastic job of re-envisioning transit. I know, because I read your bike vision statement. And if anyone here hasn't seen it, you should. It's very, very impressive. Um, in Google's vision plan, you're a part of creating new infrastructure in which residents of all abilities from ages 8 to 80 will feel safe and comfortable doing things like riding around on a bicycle here. For a company that is at the forefront of making the imagined manifest, how many more moments of Eureka, how many more ideas will you foster into reality by building the transit infrastructure that allows for agglomeration? ATP is working to inform and empower individuals to choose alternative means of transit. We see a future where as cities all over the world grow, pedestrian travel, Cyclists, cars, and public transit hold equal value for those building infrastructure. We are working to arm businesses and governments with the data necessary to comfortably justify building those facilities for the betterment of their economies and for the health and happiness of their citizens. That's where we want to go. And if we can, or if I, can convince one of you in this room to use your molecular energy ATP, to do some alternative travel ATP, and am therefore a part of a reverberating effect that reduces a person's risk of heart disease, or results in you saving money so you can take your loved one out to dinner, or spurs a chance meeting on a bike trail that figures out a way to save the polar bear, cure cancer, pr protect the Galapagos, or build that high-speed electric party train that gets us from San Francisco to LA in no time, <laughs> then the places that we're going is going to be where everyone wants to be. So thank you. <laughs>